Hello everyone, thanks for coming by. I'm back with more scary stories to tickle your inner fears. Today we have three absolutely terrifying stories. They feature some of the most terrifying creatures on the planet. Humans. I cannot fathom the terror these people went through at the time. So thank you very much for sharing, and thank you very much for allowing me to read your stories. For those that want it, I'll provide the name and link in the stories in the description. Before we start, if you have a story of your own you'd like to submit, please check the description for my email address. Now sit back, relax, and turn the lights down. Today's first story comes to us from Acid Rain X, entitled, I Stopped a Possible School Shooting When I Was a Freshman in High School. This story is 100% true, and honestly the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. At the age of 15, I moved to Southwest Houston. I had moved around for many years, primarily due to being in foster care and not really having a strong support system or family. Houston itself is somewhat nice, but naturally, I had to be placed in a home in probably one of the most ghetto parts of the city. I was honestly one of the only Caucasian people in the area, which made it somewhat difficult to make friends due to cultural differences and so on. I met a guy named David, who had a girlfriend at the time. We soon became very close, and he became very flirtatious and somewhat protective over me. I also noticed he was deeply involved with drugs and had some major anger issues. I didn't realize how truly mentally unstable he was until after hanging around with him and his girlfriend for a few months. One day, we skipped school and went to the nearest skate park. Naturally, as young burnouts, we just lounged around, smoked weed, spray painted, and kept busting our asses on the ramps at the park. After about 30 minutes, we were approached by several guys wearing fully black clothing. I recognized a couple of them from my biology class. Next thing I knew, they began to attack David. He was thrown onto the ground, being kicked and punched repeatedly. I did my best to try and pry them off David, but that only ended in me receiving several blows to the stomach and several other areas of my body until I could barely get up. That day, we both ended up in an emergency room. David told me not to breathe a word to anyone about what happened, which only created more problems for me. But I listened because for some odd reason, I trusted him. A week later, David found me in the hallway early in the morning before first period. He pulled me to the side and looked around anxiously, his eyes darting back and forth between different parts of the hallway. What's going on? I asked, completely thrown off by his sudden erratic behavior. Those guys are going to pay for what they did to us, he whispered softly. What do you mean? I said nervously. I have a gun. Miranda has one too. I'm going to take care of those fuckers today. Go home, he said through gritted teeth, reaching into his backpack and slowly revealing a black handgun. I quickly placed my hand on his, pushing his hand further down into the backpack. David, don't let anyone see that, I whispered quickly. My heart was pounding, my head was spinning, and I felt a deep pit in my stomach. My mind raced 90 miles an hour. What the fuck was wrong with him? Why did his girlfriend Miranda have a gun? What the fuck do I do? Fuck. Fuck. I don't want you to get hurt. I need to protect you, both of you. I trust you, and I know you won't tell anyone, he said quietly, his eyes softening. My thoughts continued to race, and I did the only thing I could. Try to get away from him and tell someone immediately. All right, whatever you're going to do, just wait. Let me get my foster sisters out first, okay? He nodded, and surprisingly, he let me go. I raced down two flights of stairs across the schoolyard and finally made it to the principal's office. I opened the door without knocking which did piss our school principal off, but I cut him off before he could say anything and said David F. and Miranda H. both have handguns. They both brought guns into the school. A few minutes later, the school was put into lockdown, and my only two friends that I had the entire school year were arrested. There were news reports, officers questioning me, and as you can imagine, I was grounded for quite a while for my choice of friends. I later decided to move away from that area because I wasn't sure what would happen to me if they somehow got out while I was still in the area. I don't know if they really planned to use the guns on campus. I just know that I was fucking scared. For me, for the other students, for the faculty. All I know is that maybe I saved someone's life that day. And I don't regret it. I can only imagine how terrifying this was. But the amount of courage this took is monumental. The second story comes to us from James Vagabond. Entitled, I Looked Pure Evil in the Eye. This story is 100% true. And a friend of mine actually is the reason I realized how serious this was and decided to post the story. That part is at the end. Here it goes. So I was talking to an old friend of mine 
who told me a mutual acquaintance we had, but a man who she thought was a friend sexually assaulted her. I told her how sorry I was and the stats say it's usually not a random guy, it's a person you're familiar with. But then there are other times, times like this. So my girlfriend and I go to a pool hall and are drinking and playing pool. We happen to find the only other couple there and link up. Pretty soon it's obvious my girlfriend is way too drunk for a low-key place like this, so we leave with them. The new place is a much smaller front area bar, but back area is spacious and leads to a back alley. The drunkness is creeping up on my girlfriend. She's getting more sloppy by the minute almost. I go to take a piss, and as I come back I see the couple in a corner kind of looking at me. Then looking in my girlfriend's direction, she has found two other young women to talk to. But now, also, two men have come up and one even has his arm around her. I stay calm, cooler heads always prevail. Walk up, hey baby. Then she is like, hey baby, all drunk. And the man that had his arm around her, that she didn't even notice, removed his arm. But when he did, he and his friend made eye contact and nodded. I'm eyeballing both of them and can tell that they have barely spoken to the other girls who already had drinks. They offer to get us drinks. Us as in the table. Again, the other girls have drinks. I try to decline, but my sloshed girlfriend is thinking it's nice. One guy comes back with a drink for me and one for my girl. Nobody else was given drinks by these men. Hands my girlfriend hers first, and then mine. As she starts to lift it, I put my hand over it and whisper, You've had enough. You're all done. Then as these two creeps look at me, raise my cup, I obviously drop it right on the guy's shoe who gave it to me and go, Oops. Not I'm sorry. Not my bad. And he looks right into my eyes and says, Oh, it's okay. I'll get you another. With the most sinister look I've ever seen. We both knew what him and his friend or relative were doing. They looked alike. More on that later. So I then grabbed my girlfriend very hard and said, we're leaving now. If you try to make a scene, I'm going to pull out a knife and kill anyone that tries to separate us. I will pick you up and run. We have to leave now, baby. Trust me. And she kind of just understood through her drunk state how serious I was. I was so scared she was going to cause a scene. Had the bouncer toss me and be alone with those wolves. I was scared of us getting separated. We got home and I cried. I remember that the last hundred foot walk to our car in the dark holding her up. So glad we didn't drink any of the last drinks we were offered that were clearly spiked with the drug. Now back to before. This happened in the town of Lodi, California. A small town. I did not recognize, nor did these men seem to know anyone. Both Arabic, well dressed, decent looking. So I tell my friend this, and she gasps. The neighboring town Stockton had the same thing happen. A lot. Successfully. At this bar called Rooftops on Sunday. They had flyers warning people about them and a description. There was a Facebook page dedicated to identifying these men and a hotline for tips. These guys were pure evil. They were going to drug us, toss us, and God knows what else to my sweetheart. I shudder thinking about it. If I had been just a little more drunk, a little more off, less sharp that night, what could have happened? I can only imagine the scenarios that played out in his head. Well done for keeping your head about you. Our last story comes from Skeet's Data Droid, entitled The Home Invasion. Several years ago, I was involved in a car accident that caused some minor spinal injuries, mostly swelling that resulted in partial paralysis. Not able to return home due to us living in an apartment on the second floor with no elevator, I became a resident at a physical therapy rehabilitation center. After finally regaining the ability to walk aided by my walker and moving around in a wheelchair, it was decided that I would get my own place using Section 8 housing. After much searching, I found a nice spot, a ground floor condominium in a relatively safe part of town. The one room condo had a wide living room with attached kitchenette and a wide hallway leading to the bedroom in the back of the place. With my family's help, I was all moved in and ready to begin living independently for the first time. After a great first meal in my own place, pizza from a local restaurant, I decided to go to bed. As days turned to weeks, I began to learn the ins and outs of life in this condo complex, and for the most part, everything was fine, except for the skeevy guy who would often be seen prowling around, who I later learned was the brother of one of my neighbors. Said sleazeball was a perpetually recovering meth addict, who would live with his brother whenever his girlfriend would throw him out of their apartment. Upon learning this news, my father came to see me one evening out of the blue. After a nice dinner, he asked me if I still had my concealed carry permit and me, being a proud supporter of the Second Amendment, answered in the affirmative. However, 
My gun was still in storage and not yet in my possession. He smiled and reached into his bag and presented me with a housewarming present. An X-Tac Elite Carry Comp, one of his favorite pieces from his collection. After bidding my father a fond farewell, I decided to retire to my bedroom and after watching YouTube videos on my Fire TV, decided to fall asleep. A few weeks go by and I largely forget about my new toy having stashed it in the drawer next to my bed until the day in question. I had to do some grocery shopping and after calling for my transportation, a company called Veo that offers free rides for the disabled, I go to the store and buy my groceries for the week and after thanking the driver for helping me bring them inside, I pack them away and once again retire to bed. Several hours later, I wake up to a noise that sounds like scratching at my bedroom door. Opening it, I see nothing, but hear it further down the hallway and it hits me that someone is trying to pry the door open. Slowly closing the bedroom door, I fish in the drawer for my gun and taking it out of the holster and placing it at my side with the safety off, I slowly roll down the hallway to the kitchen, just in time to hear the door give way. A flashlight beam scans the interior just in front of the door as the shadowy silhouette of the intruder enters. Needless to say, he is surprised when I flip on the lights and he finds himself bathed in the fluorescent glow of the overhead lights. He looks at me shocked at first and then remembering that he's got a knife and I'm seemingly a helpless guy in a wheelchair. His eyes suddenly grow to the size of saucers as I produce my gun from the chair beside me and fire, hitting him center mass. He drops his knife and heads screaming outside the door and collapses on the ground feet away. I hear his labored breathing, most likely from a collapsed lung, and grab for the phone to call the police. As I'm on the phone with them, other residents, probably woken by either the shot or the subsequent scream, emerge from their condos to see the potential robbers splayed out on the lawn. The police soon arrive and render emergency first aid to the guy before paramedics arrived and took over. I give my statement to the police and they of course have to take my gun in as evidence, which I begrudgingly hand over. I later get it back after the shooters ruled self-defense. Yippee. Come to find out sometime later that my late night visitor was the sketchy brother of my neighbor. The police said that he confessed to planning on robbing me because, quote, cripples are easy targets, his exact words. The cop who told me this looked at me and smiled slyly saying that he chose the wrong cripple I guess with a reassuring pat on the shoulder. As for the brother who was my neighbor, he and his girlfriend were encouraged to move out and I was thankful to see them go because a new tenant moved in soon afterward, a much better person if I do say so myself. The drug addict brother survived and last I heard he was in prison with a five year sentence for armed robbery in the first degree. I am thankful that everyone is okay and I do hope the invader learned a valuable lesson, especially after being shot and jailed for five years. Thanks again everyone for stopping by. If you enjoyed the video please be sure to hit that like button and until next time, remember, just because you couldn't see it doesn't mean it wasn't watching.